All right. Welcome, welcome everybody to the module five fireside on tokens and mechanism design. This is one of my favorite modules and represents to me a turning point in the kernel syllabus. Uh, along with last week on information age institutions, we start to look forward to not what has happened in Web3 and trying to understand it in historical context, uh, but looking ahead to the vast uh, space that we have ahead of us when we are building this digital universe based on distributed trust. So we're very lucky today for it to be, I think, hopefully the most conversational of the firesides. It's just Andy and I. Um, and we would love to be interrupted often. We would love to have as many voices as are keen to participate, even in the just kind of ongoings of the conversation. There will be a presentation of some small variety that we'll do prior to that, um, an idea that we want to seed the conversational space with. And after that, lots of time for Q&A, perhaps more than, than any other fireside we've had thus far. So. Um, if you have thoughts, the chat is always the best place and we'll be very active in there, curating towards the best garden of discussion that we can find. Um, given we have no guests this week, we get to move quickly. Um, I just wanna set the tone of where we are in kernel as we do. Um, we've finalized uh, Expo Week last week. It was really wonderful. Truly, I think the best Expo that we've we've had, and it's really because of all of you. Thank you, everyone who participated and joined uh, as supporters to people that are building projects. And we are uh, excited about the the next few weeks because it's really kind of like a quieter period of Kernel. It's I think often the case that the beginning is really loud and there's lots of stuff going on um, but as time goes on there's an increased uh, opening for for silence and enjoying the space as it is that that you want to so we have the guilds that continue on through week seven this is week five so we have three weeks left the uh, pace for that is perhaps something you're more familiar with at this point and uh, that really takes us through the last three modules. We'll have a couple more modules that we'll, we'll do in terms of the syllabus. And there is a kernel showcase at the end, which I think I got a question on this, so just to, to respond to it, um, that, that doesn't have to be the case that you were at Expo in order to participate in showcase. Showcase is a bit more public facing. We made the Expo um, by design, kind of like a mid block exercise. And, starting to show what what it is that you're up to in, in web3 whatever that may be um, and showcase is an opportunity for a more public statement of okay this is this is the particular project that i want to spend some energy on right now or the adventure that i've been on um, so we'll share more on showcase soon i think it's possible we do it on just the 19th uh, which is november's friday prior to thanksgiving in america um, and then November 22nd is Monday, uh, but we'll share more on that probably next week. No big rush uh, right now on that front. Um, it's a time where I think if you have been a bit more internally focused, either on your own kind of like journey uh, to potentially think back to um, any type of serendipity that you want to tap into within Kernel, there's uh, three weeks left. Uh, it's kind of a quieter space. You can maybe pick and choose the types of conversations that you would be most interested in um, or the people that you haven't really gotten to say hello to yet, but but you'd like to before the block ends. We have you know about three weeks left for that type of thing. Um, if you have prototypes or things that you're building, could be a good time to get ideas on those. And still, as the block goes on, we hope, it, it feels more and more focused for you in terms of what it is that you, you want to explore and, and where your heart is leading you in terms of uh, Web3, but also uh, into you know, a new year uh, ahead coming up. So 
with that, I'll pass the mic to Andy uh, for a bit of the introduction on this week's materials. I will eventually take the mic back to, I think for the first time, properly introduce Andy, um, at least some things that I would like to share. And then, and then we have some ideas on ownership uh, that perhaps uh, we can get into a bit after that. Thank you so much. So this week is really about incentives, listening and stories. Um, it does represent something of a turning point. And I have spoken about this particular module before in a previous fireside, if you wanna go and look at some of the more kind of technical uh, underpinnings of tokens and mechanism design, which we might not speak about entirely today, but uh, there is something to be noted that uh, listening and intention are sort of number four and five in our personal principles because they do form the very heart of what it is that we're here to talk about. Uh, and listening as it is talked about in that particular piece forms what one might call the silent undercurrents of the entire kernel syllabus because when I truly listen to somebody, uh, I force them to pay attention to what it is that they're saying and therefore speak more accurately and bring our shared dialogue closer to truth in some really important and deep way. Listening can be done not in order to respond, but as a response in itself. You will find this in your own life. All you need to do is test it and observe the results in your own experience. If you truly listen to somebody with unconditional presence, without any kind of prejudice, without any kind of impulse toward uh, proving your own opinion, proving yourself to be more informed or more educated or more aware than another, you will find that conversations of their own accord shift towards harmony and towards truth. Uh, I strongly encourage you to try that because in so doing, you learn how to tell better stories. Uh, and it's when we can tell better stories by listening to the things that really move us that we can begin to excavate again in our own experience and observationally what kinds of behaviors are really worth incentivizing because that's the intergenerational truth that narrative holds for all of us right it's like what behaviors are pro-social and what are to be avoided that's that's fundamentally what stories are about whether it's fairy tales or philosophy texts uh, they come down to this particular ethical question of what is worth loving and how do i behave in a way that is in accord with that which is worth loving uh, and again we can speak about those two ethical questions because they have some really interesting uh, corollaries um, so once we can understand what it is worth incentivizing, then the question becomes one of the mechanism. How do we actually do this in a way which can be replicated and used by many different people of many different value systems and many different persuasions in ways which are truly creative and constructive within the context of their own lives? Uh, and that particular word context is going to be very, very important today. Uh, context has a well-defined meaning within software and particularly within the world of smart contracts. If you've been on the Solidity Guild, you will understand this thing about context when we spoke of delegate call and some of the low-level features of the EVM. Uh, but it has a wider appeal in terms of our ability to speak about, understand, and design non-coercive systems. And that's something else that we perhaps will talk about today because non-coerciveness listening uh, and the particular narratives by which we shape increasingly pro-social universes uh, are going to be an important part of the next decade at least so that's a very broad overview of module five and uh, Vivek can then turn the tables finally and have me entertain him with his questions rather than the other way around. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, I've been waiting for this for four weeks. So um, let me revel in this moment where I get to interview Andy. Um, but I wanna, I wanna 
touch on one thing that, that Andy has referred to here. Um, it's kind of, it'll come up later, but one of the questions that we are asking uh, specifically this week is what economic games do your contracts incentivize or the second and third order effects? And for me, contracts here could be replaced even with the word stories. What economic games do your stories incentivize? Um, because in some ways, contracts are the truest forms of the stories that we can tell and write on something like an EVM. But before they go on an EVM, very often uh, there's conversations on places like Twitter and other places of public discourse in Web3. And one of the conversations is this week and at this point in time, a lot about ownership. Uh, there's this context around tokens right now that usually describes tokens as a means for owning a piece of the um, spaces that you are a part of. And there's a lot of positive connotation that's being provided to these things. I want to just brought, jump back up here to say that you know the definition that we provide more from the history of the word token is not a token to own, uh, but, but comes more from this background of learning and teaching and uh, a representation of, 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 of fact. Um, and so there's a lot perhaps that we'll go into further there, but um, I really, really appreciate the framing of this week's module, because I think for me personally, it's allowed me to think more broadly about what types of token games we can design and we can play. Um, the other thing that has helped me a lot in that process is uh, you know, being friends with Andy. <laughs> He's been one of my greatest friends and someone I met in uh, just the last few years uh, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, in Toronto at a conference called EdCon. Um, there was all these talks on like different things that were going on in Ethereum world at the time, which was a lot already. I remember meeting Yaniv from The Graph, who was kind of just starting with his idea there at that conference. Kevin and I uh, met Vitalik for the first time uh, and, and told him, hey, we're doing this like Gitcoin thing. Can you like talk to us about bounties and um, there's a lot of like funny moments from that conference, but I remember specifically, um, I was, I was kind of like really tired and I like popped into one of the, uh, conference rooms at the time where a guy with some funny pants was on stage talking about the perfect language. And it was one of these things I was like, well, we're at an Ethereum conference. Why, why are we talking about languages? What does this have to do with anything? Um, but you kind of sit there and you're like, okay, let me just like relax for a second. And <laughs> at least, at least I'll get to like sit in the background, but then, then you start listening. And I don't know if I even took in any of the words early on. It was kind of this like nice South African drawl that was really calming me into my seat. And, uh, I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting. Um, and, and he was talking about ideas that, um, clearly tied back to, technical concepts and ultimately we're we're describing ethereum as the perfect language um not necessarily ethereum i'll let andy get back to that maybe in module seven but it was the the starting point of of conversation with andy we we, we hung out a bit there and you get to get a sense of like where he had come from he probably was talking about language because of a deep interest in it from well before uh, any technical explorations of things like Bitcoin. He had studied English at Oxford prior to that, English um, in his undergrad, but also had a background in physics and maths, which to me started to piece together why when we talked in conversation, we would kind of very easily transition from talking about philosophy or religion to deep technical concepts to um, the latest bonding curve experiments, uh, which at the time, he was at Status working on DAPS, which uh, is a really cool project uh, that was exploring how to best rank uh, different token communities in the most non-coercive ways. And so 
you know, that was my introduction to time with Andy. Um, I was lucky to get to visit him in South Africa uh, about a year later um, after lots of personal explorations that we had had um, on other notes. And for me, you know, whenever I had some interesting life questions that I didn't have good answers to, it just happened that even though I'd met Andy only once, I, I felt like I wanted to talk to him about them for some reason. And um, it was really only during that point where I got a sense of like some of the writing that Andy was doing outside of Web3 stuff. Um, in the bottom here, you'll see five digital books, um, all related to um, the first of the books, which was titled The Blue Book. And um, in those books, I think you get a better sense of uh, the space from with which Andy is approaching Web3. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but I think to best understand a lot of the things happening in the kernel syllabus, uh, there is a deeper rabbit hole of sorts if you're keen on exploring. And uh, it, it really starts, I think, with Andy's profile picture there, which you'll see on his Twitter, um, which is, uh, I think, a very funny image, uh, but, but a really good indication of of how Andy has been approaching things. Um, and I'm very grateful that he's been around with us for Kernel. Um, in order to allow him to uh, explore immediately into you know, what he's been thinking about, uh, one of the ideas that we've been really struggling with, both of us, and I think others in Kernel have been, is, has been ownership. And the sense that if we are talking about owning as the main story that we tell um, as it relates to Web3, we may be entering patterns that are in many ways worse than the ones from the Web2 internet. Um, and this is something that I think Andy and I have been exploring. I think Tim Courtney put a really awesome post in Slack the other day. Uh, in a general channel. He said, DAOs seem like free-for-alls with no structure to me. I fear my work won't be valued. I don't do great seeking attention and recognition in big crowds. Um, I float, I'm not one of the cool kids. I've never been a click person. Um, you know, these, these spaces that in theory should be bestowing ownership and there's, there's a lot of value to that. Um, they, they don't immediately seem like they're creating better group norms in a lot of ways than, than Web2. And so what, what is that all about? And are there other stories that we might be able to tell in the exploration? Um, Michael Keating, uh, who I'm not sure if he's here today, but he's very graciously started a tokenomics track, or not track, but Junto series um, within the Web3 Communities Guild. And uh, one of the people that we've had on it was this week was Sam Williams, who, um, is truly incredible and had an insight shared about ownerless public digital spaces that I think in many ways has been an inspiration for what will be a continuation into exploring that idea. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Andy, perhaps to share a bit more on the signature economies and what he's been thinking about there. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly the longest introduction I've ever received. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that uh, it's worth discussing at length this notion of ownership. Um, the title is a riff of something that was written by Jesse Walden and has been spoken about by Chris Dixon, both of whom are people that I respect. And yet I think that they're very deeply wrong or at least misguided about this particular term that they've chosen, the ownership economy. Um, and it's worth kind of going into some detail as to where that comes from, the impulse toward ownership and how we might better think about what this actually is about and how it relates to mechanism design in particular, which was sort of the feature of our discussion with Sam. Um, but hopefully we can broaden it in this particular bio side. Um, it's worth 
has, is generally the case with me, starting with something fairly unrelated to this, which is a quote from Audrey Lord. She said that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And given that we can't use the same notions of ownership, we can't use the simplistic mapping of ownership to possession or authority or control if we want to build something substantively new and different, something that is fundamentally inclusive. Um, and so, you know, I sort of sat down and thought, well, it's not good enough just to say that Chris and Jesse have been misguided in coming up with this term, the ownership economy. I need to think about where it comes from. And, you know, public networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum have this really uh, fascinating paradox of ownership at the center of them, right? Uh, when Bitcoin got going, all of the rhetoric was around ownerlessness, the anonymity or pseudonymity of Satoshi, the fact that there was no CEO anywhere in sight that you could hold before Congress and hold accountable for launching some kind of monetary system, which was not specifically in line with uh, current regulation. And yet simultaneously with that ownerless narrative was this thing of not your keys, not your coins. You know, uh, anybody who creates a key pair kind of irrefutably owns any of the coins associated with it. And so there's this fascinating tension, right? That if the network has no owner, then everybody becomes an owner. And yet if everybody becomes an owner, then that renders the term owner meaningless unless we reimagine what it signifies. And in order to begin doing that, one of the questions that we can ask is, what do you actually possess? Um, so in Bitcoin, you have the right to sign an unspent transaction output over to another address, this UTXO based model. And in Ethereum and other account based models, you, you, you own the ability to sign a message which will update some key value pairs shared in storage somewhere in our shared state. Uh, and so what the ownership economy is really about is the meaningful signatures required to engage validly in consensually symbolic execution. And so that's a lot of like fancy words, <laughs> but it's really all about these meaningful signatures, right? It's, it's the signature economies. And there's a very particular use of the plural form there, which we can get into. Um, but kind of the critical question that I want to ask and which I've been thinking about both in the context of the conversation with Sam, but also more broadly is, you know, is ownership the meaning of that word? Is ownership shifting from an ability to demonstrate control, possession or authority to the ability to make meaning? And this goes to the heart of reimagining these terms, right? Because ownership is it's about exclusive rights. That's why if everybody is an owner, it becomes meaningless because there's no exclusionary aspect to it. Whereas meaning is made valuable by what it includes, right? And so if ownership is about making meaning, then there's some really interesting mechanism which must be reimagined at the heart of what this word signifies. Um, and attached to this question of is ownership shifting away from control and toward making meaning are two others, which is, you know, can we create environments in which whatever I own is communal? Uh, and what will get us closer to imagining this unimaginable paradox? So as a attempt to begin kind of unpacking this notion of me owning something which is communal, uh, you know, we can we can look at two words, one of which is in the syllabus, this notion of responsibility, right? response hyphen ability. Uh, and, and the other is a philosophical concept from Africa, which I am a great fan of, called Ubuntu, uh, which is something I will discuss in just a moment. And, you know, like, to go back to that phrase from the early days of Bitcoins, not your keys, not your coins, it was used to connote sovereign rights. And if you hold the keys, then you have an absolute and unimpeachable right to sign as you please. Uh, but it turns out though, that managing your own keys is risky and it's a UX nightmare, right? It's a user experience disaster. And this is because it actually has nothing to do with rights. 
and everything to do with responsibility. The ability to create a valid signature with a given key is an architectural feature of the network. It has nothing to do with you as an individual, right? So it's more akin to a physical law than a legal statute. Um, this, this stuff is not about rights. It, it's about responsibility. And just as we made the point in module two that there's no such thing as free speech on chain, it's just increasingly costly symbolic execution for increasingly complex kinds of state changes. You have no rights on chain, right? You only have responsibility for the kinds of meaning you sign into existence. This is the point that I really wanna kind of just repeat for emphasis. You have no rights on chain. You only have responsibility for the kinds of meaning that you sign into existence. And you know, from the individual's perspective, I am not responsible for the network. Although I may respond to it by virtue of my ability to sign any kind of transaction. And so this thing of response to rather than responsibility for implies the same kind of internal state as this word that I really love and which Renee will recognize of kaitiaki, a Maori word which means guardianship. But it's not guardianship in the sense of control or authority, it's guardianship in the sense of care. We are guardians of the rivers and the forests and the sky and the clouds in the sense that we care for them, not control them. Uh, and it's that kind of shift in signification, which I think we're after here, right? It's like ownership, not as possession or control, but as care and service, as responsibility to, not responsibility for, and all of the control and imposition and coercion that goes along with that kind of thing. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, this is kind of what mechanism design is at, the best, at its best crafts, incentive structures, which create the context required for people to sign into a communal record, the things that they find most personally meaningful, right? And that's kind of where the discussion with Sam really becomes its most interesting because there is this notion that in our weave and systems like it with highly intentional mechanism design underneath, you can have everybody playing their own game. There's no consensually forced uh, mechanism it's really just the emergent results of everybody's unique strategy that becomes the meta game that we all play. And when we're highly intentional about, about how we see that sort of infinite game and the way in which we incentivize, we are incentivized to incentivize others toward pro-social behavior, we can achieve these kinds of second order effects, which mathematically can be proven to move us more and more and more towards pro-social behavior. But this thing, you know, like the other aspect that I kind of want to focus on here, because as you say, I spent a lot of time, probably too much studying literature, uh, is, is just the word signature itself. You know, what, what does it mean to sign into existence different kinds of meaning or value? Uh, because, because that's what we do every time we submit a transaction. So much, it's what so much of my own work is about, is illustrating in a tangible and visible way, which is what a token does, right? It represents a fact in a tangible and visible way. The fact that economic transaction and artistic expression are one and the same thing when we create intentional and perhaps even ceremonial economic space, which is a possibility. It's not an inevitability, uh, but it is certainly a possibility on these kinds of networks. And this thing about signature is really fascinating, right? and the signature economies, you know, because it, it, it connotes both that which is sort of personally irreducibly uniquely you, you know, it's your signature, nobody else can uh, copy it. There's, there's something, you know, vibrationally you about it uh, that is irreducible and unique, but it is also that which binds you contractually to a world beyond yourself, right? It is, it is that unique mark that only you can make which acknowledges that there is an entire world beyond the self, right? In my favorite philosopher's terms, Jacques Derrida, he talks about it. The singular is at once, the signature is at once singular. It's irreducible to you and it has to be iterable. It has to be shared, you know, all of the time uh, in order for you to enter into all of these contracts. Uh, you know, so it's uh, the condition of its possibility is that once it's impossibility, it's something else that he says, which I adore. Um, but, you know, like 
I think that a wonderfully revealing phrase that carries the same kind of paradoxical structure of this singularity and iterability, which goes along with the heart of making any meaning, of engaging in any kind of mechanism which can both reveal to myself who I really am and engage with a wider world in an ongoing fashion, is this old Isi Zulu saying, umuntugu muntu gabantu. Uh, which is a wonderfully lyrical, for, I could just say that for the rest of the fireside, um, and, and, and what it means in English is a human being is only a human being through other human beings. So you have this possibility of real individuation, like full human being, singularity, who you really are, but it is only possible in community. It is only possible in relationship. You can only become a full human being by fulfilling your responsibilities, not by asserting your rights. A community is not about rights, it's about care and the costs we are willing to bear for one another. It is about who you are willing to be responsible with and to, right? who you're willing to respond to. This is why so much of how you actually engender healthy community online has to do with how you allocate attention not about uh, censure or maintaining principles or any of these kind of high-minded things. It's simply a case of how you allocate your attention, what you respond to. Uh, and as a piece of insight from what I've learned over the last eight years in building these kinds of communities, it's really critical that you understand that even if you see something negative occurring in the communities with which you have cho chosen to associate, the galaxy brain move in that particular kind of environment is often to simply ignore it because attention is the scarce resource and if you're capable of truly intentionally and deeply directing your attention to that which is valuable in your own regard you will find that your community shifts over time uh, towards that which is harmonious and true in the same way that active listening in a conversation with unconditional presence will shift that dialogical instant closer to the truth. And this is kind of the most interesting feature of all of the stuff about you know, signatures and events and contexts and meaning and value is that meaningful words arise as a result of a community who agrees upon their use. That's it. And, and it's why language is the only logically decentralized system that we know. It's just decided upon by communal use. It's that simple. And when what we say and how we say it invites people in and calls up a response, meaning is made more widely accessible. And when we cast these new networks as economies of sign rather than of ownership, then the game becomes one of actively finding more people able to respond rather than rushing to sort of assert exclusive rights to some artificially scarce series of bits. Um, so that's, you know, so much of what I'm interested in at the moment is this thing of uh, how do we find more and more people to respond? <laughs> what does it mean to intentionally set about creating uh, and cultivating economies of sign? Uh, and, and, and how do we, uh, how do we do that together? Right, because uh, there is there's so much more lit literary theory I could go into with Ferdinand de Sosa and the signified and the signifier and the sign, but the sign is just the Tao, right? <laughs> so that which the sign which can be signed is not the real sign. Uh, that one's for Ben if he's here. <laughs> um, but but yeah, that's that's kind of where I am at the moment. And Vivek, if you're if you're wanting to speak sort of more technically about uh what kinds of mechanisms and practical examples like are we've illustrates the kinds of uh patterns that i've, I've laid out here uh, or sort of this idea of neutral tools and interfaces which came from that yancy last week uh, we can go into any of that okay. yeah um i would be open to seeing now if there are any thoughts from the chat or anyone who would would be interested to share. I think that there's a one affirmative for illustrating with examples. Um, in 
following that thread then the getting into our weave could work um i don't know that getting super into the weeds makes as much sense uh, but mm -hmm. some there and mm -hmm. um and yeah i'm not sure exactly how you would do it with the ANSI's materials but i think that might be a better place to spend a bit more time if you could sure sure absolutely they're, they're actually related at, the, at this high level right in the sense that like one of the great uh, moments I thought in Yancy's discussion last week, there are, there are a few of them, uh, and I'll name two, the one just as a sort of throwaway, which is that like he mentioned how we are globally empathic and locally apathetic because we're not willing to bear the cost of connection. This is something to reflect on, I think, for the rest of kernel and potentially like well into Web3, right? The connection comes with a cost. It's not just about belonging supports love and fields of daffodils with gamboling labradors and uh rainbows and wonderful you know daisies and this kind of stuff that there is a there's a real cost in in maintaining relationship in being responsible to and with another person uh and that's something which is worth thinking about and has deep links to this notion that community is defined by those with whom you are in a little bit of debt always right old david grieber uh, idea which comes from our more anarchistic roots and the dawn of everything. The other thing which he was, I think, so brilliantly clear about and which can be kind of easy to miss because it was so humble and just kind of, yeah, this is who I am, <laughs> was that the bento is a wonderful example of a tool interface or ritual which does not impose upon you in any kind of dogmatic way uh a sort of overarching narrative structure for your belief all it's trying to do is get you to see clearly what your own values are right in this sense it is a wonderful example of an internet age institution institution in the sense of custom and practice which is premised in credible neutrality right uh, that the whole idea is not to sort of get you to believe a certain set of things it's get you it's to get you to see who you really are and what you really think and what you really value and from there begin to make more informed and intentional decisions right the same thing we can be seen that same structure right that same mechanism because it, like it's always the same mechanisms there's nothing new under the sun it's just that we apply them in increasingly different contexts that's derrida's whole point for those of you who are interested in literary theory right is that like the 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 fact that writing exists and can be singular particularly these notions of signatures or performative speech acts is at once like its possibility of existence is at once its impossibility because like it can be grafted it can be taken out and grafted into endlessly infinite number of contexts right and so like this is all we're doing at a high level conceptually is we're looking for like these particularly like credibly neutral mechanisms rituals customs practices whatever you want to call them and grafting them into increasingly powerful contexts right the fight for liberty doesn't take place at the level of natural language anymore it takes place at the level of protocols in terms of the functions that you can get your language to execute and all we're doing in this great work <laughs> is finding those credibly neutral things that allow people to see themselves as they are, really are allow them to see others as they really are and find useful and valuable ways of interacting and grafting them deeper and deeper and deeper into different levels of the protocol or different levels of the protocols by which we interact, right? Important that these things are plural. Uh, and a big shout out to Jasmine Wang and the pluriverse, the home of heart, right? The heart doesn't need one way of interacting with another. It can relate through the infinite. That's its wonderful capacity. Um, the ways in which this notion of credible neutrality and seeing yourself as you really are and what values you actually have as we sort of demonstrated in the bento box relates to our weaves mechanism design which is about adaptive interacting incentive agents is that in our weave as somebody who is running a node you can write whatever strategy you want right and you have two basic incentives the one is to it's self-interest right it's to optimize the gains that you are receiving from the network but there is another part to it which is that you have to uh, pass on some tiny percentage of that to other nodes in the network 
who you deem to be behaving in a way which you think is pro-social. But you don't have to share how you arrive at those rankings with anybody else, uh, which is exactly how we operate in the normal world. All of us are ramp ranking each other reputationally all of the time, but we never share the methodology by which we arrive at that. We're often not even aware of it ourselves. And the fascinating thing about these adaptive interacting incentive agents is that anybody can write their own strategy and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and, and, and this is why it's so difficult to describe and why somebody who is as vastly as intelligent as Sam does still struggles to find the language because our language itself is coercive, right? Even the very structure of you and I, of speaker and listener, there's something uh, inherent in that which contains a power dynamic that has been encoded in increasingly coercive ways over the developments of various different languages. And when we begin to see that, then all of a sudden people come up with non-coercive mechanisms where it's like, hey, code whatever strategy you want, you know, put whatever you want in your bento box. If you want to add past me and past us, go crazy. If you want to add a nine make nine by you know sort of three by three matrix, go crazy, do it all, it doesn't matter, you know, and the same thing with are we incentives, okay, you want to like incentivize people with AR tokens, do it, you want to incentivize people by sending them headers first, do it, you want to incentivize people by giving them query prioritization, do it, you want to incentivize them by some other method that you've come up with and that you don't want to share with any other people, do it, <laughs> right, you want to try and pull your resources uh, as like a mining pool on are we even not share data with anybody else because that's you know, it could be like a more optimal strategy, do it. And somebody did do it, HPool, and the rest of the network got really pissed off with them and updated their own strategies to not share data with HPool. And all of a sudden HPool is kind of like out of our weave. No, you know, like huge kind of drama on the maker forum or, uh, you know, personal attacks and mudslinging or whatever, just a line of code in a strategy file in your node operator software in your clients and all of a sudden <laughs> you know the network the meta game being played updates no big no big stress you know this is the kind of thing that i think is really interesting because like it's mechanism design at that level which then allows for all sorts of interesting games to be played in increasingly infinite ways um so yeah, these things are, are inherently connected. It's just that we don't often see them that way because they take place in such radically different contexts. Amazing. I think that those are really helpful examples, both at the deep technical level for our weave, I mean, at least in a kind of like technical game, which if you haven't seen this, this talk, which I know not everyone was there, it, it really was one of the best things I think that we've we've hosted in kernel. So really big shout out to Michael Keating for getting the energy going in that particular direction. Um, I, I wanna take a step back out and perhaps uh, if Sylvia would be willing, um, there's a question in the chat that I think is uh, really the, the biggest open question here about ownership and um, how we tell the story, not only to ourselves, but also to others. If Sylvia, you would be willing. Sure. sure. Um, so, so this is kind of like not a um, you know um, exhaustive view, but basically one thing about ownership is it's just such an easy concept to understand and something that we're so used to think about. Um, so, from my perspective, although it is you know like Web three is much more complex than just you know, like ownership of, of a website, et cetera, like, you know, the way Chris Dixon talk about it. I think it's just, it's just a great way to get people on board uh, when you talk about um, just like helping people understand what Web3 is. So in a sense, it's, it's less about kind of like being philosophically correct or even like structurally correct in terms of like how you're gonna structure the mechanism, but it's about uh, ramping up adoption. Uh, just like getting as many people on board as possible. Um, and, and, you know, like sometimes I found that with concepts that are just so fundamentally different to the status quo, it can be just, it just can be like a practical way um, to, to involve more people. And once people kind of like start digging into the concepts and just like playing around with the protocols, et cetera, 
um, then you can kind of like move on to the next level of understanding. It's amazing, yeah. Uh, and the if you feel that way, then that's absolutely what you should run with. Um, I think that I, I would say a few things to this, right? The, the first is that uh, it's funny to me because while it is the while it is a, a more accessible concept in some ways, right, which is closer to us in terms of our cultural conditioning and our own backgrounds, education, and upbringing. It is, in fact, the thing which excludes the majority of people, right? By definition, ownership is about exclusionary rights, like it's, it's exclusive rights to something. That's that's literally what the word means, and and it has this exclusionary flavor to it, right? Uh, it, it it might not seem like that. It may that you're inviting people into the inner circle, you know, come and like just take your share of ownership in the new economy. And you're right that that does have a certain kind of psychological impulse. But the question again is like. Hey, what is your time horizon? <laughs> you know, you you get to sort of get what's yours and uh, you know take it and run, and that, and that's fine. There are many people for whom that is the case, and who have I think probably valid reasons for doing that. That's there's genuinely no judgment on, on that particular way, and if it gets people in, that's fantastic. But I do also like just on my own like personal level, I think that. So much of this is is not about excluding anymore, right? It's, it's about like how can we find more and increasingly better ways of including people, and I, I, you know, this is why like I I spent some time thinking about like okay, so if not ownership, precisely because of like this beautiful question that you've raised, like what else is accessible and understandable to people? Signatures are that, right? Like they're not any more complicated. You sign stuff all the time, um, and it is like a mark of your unicity, right? It, it, it is a mark that uh, you were here, that you understood that there was a meeting of the minds, that there was uh, some kind of give and take, that there was a relationship that has been established. All of these things are implicit in signatures and all of them are immediately accessible to anybody who has signed anything, whether it's a contract, whether it's a check, whether it's whatever. Um, and, and it's inherently inclusive, right? Uh, another. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I could speak more about Derrida and this marvelous essay that I've kind of been referencing, but, but it's maybe a little bit further <laughs> away from what you're talking about. The, the, the last thing that I want to say on this particular thing, Sylvia, is that one of the great learnings for me from various different spiritual traditions is like often the way that they are spoken of is, you know, in terms of like, various different steps along the ladder of consciousness or uh, along the path or whatever it is right and and, and we're constantly sort of told that there's uh, you know like the eight um, noble truths and, and you kind of have to go through them and develop each aspect or like in Sufism there are four different aspects to the sort of journey through consciousness and when that kind of model is used to describe things it's incredibly helpful right it, but all it is is a helpful illusion because the fact of it is that all of us are going through all of these different stages all of the time it's not a linear thing that we move from sort of uh, lower down to higher up it's that we go through all all the different stages all of the time and mm -hmm. while these kinds of ideas might seem like they're a little bit further along like the ladder of consciousness or whatever you want to call it uh, everything is happening simultaneously. <laughs> we just don't perceive it as that because we are localized in, in space and time as a particular character and a particular personality, which is necessary. You know, space exists so that it doesn't all seem like it's happening to you and time exists so that it doesn't all seem like it's happening at once, but it is all happening to you and it is all happening now. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> we, we, we sort of need these, these helpful illusions, uh, linear steps along the way to, you know, help us integrate that kind of information in a healthy and constructive and creative way. So you're right that it is like perhaps a little bit further along or a little bit further away from like most people's current conceptions of what is interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, yeah, I'm somebody who really values words. Uh, and, and I know intuitively and deeply within me that like 
carrying on with this thing about the ownership economy is only going to exclude in the long run because that's what the word does by definition. Yeah, so I think the problem with the ownership economy is that like it automatically like, uh, brings up the concept of competition, right? Because there's something kind of like implicit in ownership that um, that is competition. So um, I think it's really hard. Like, I, I think the, well, so the problem that I see is that it doesn't kind of like transmit um, the idea of collaboration enough. Um, which is, you know, like very, um, very important for web, for web three. Yeah. But I do think yeah. that it can be a useful simplification. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So you know, we, we like you know we like helpful illusions. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, and and you're right. The piece about competition is an interesting one. But it's also not something that I think signature necessarily precludes. It just again it shifts the signification of it. Right. Like you have a signature label or like a signature dish. Or you know, there's there's so many other connotations to this particular word that I haven't really gone into in this uh, discussion, and 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 those kinds of things allow for uh, like healthy kinds of competition, where like what we're competing to do is to be kind, <laughs> or to serve, or to care. You know, like what what happens if we can like harness that like human impulse toward competition and have it be such that like it's, it's competition for like providing software as service or for providing the highest level of care to those that you love. These kinds of things are like interesting to consider because it doesn't like deny or suppress again, like any aspects of human nature. But what it does is through like the conscious programming of different incentives, shift our behavior towards like pro-social goods. I wanna return us to the chat um, and perhaps like, yeah, we could hear a few voices. Um, I know Ben posted a great thought. We have Ryan and Tanaya. Uh, if anyone, uh, I know Tim Courtney with some cheeky thoughts on practicality. Anyone who would feel um, interested? I know that Griff has joined us, uh, and mm -hmm. if he's if he's somewhere. Uh, Perhaps he can talk a little bit about his own experiences with uh, designing incentives for commons, and uh, you know, thinking about like the space to both know yourself and the kinds of silence uh, which might go along with that, but also genuine co-opetition and collaboration with others, and maybe you know, even just tell us a few stories of uh, where you've been, Griff, if you're around. Griff, if, if you don't mind, I, I really want to get to it. And I think we will in maybe the next few, but I want to give a chance to Devin and a couple of others um, and just pose some of those questions out loud, maybe as an introduction to Griff, who's incredible and has lots to share, I think, on these topics. Devin, would you like to go first? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I definitely appreciate all the words of ownership um, and signatures. I guess what I've been trying to wrap my head around and what I'm kind of trying to build is how do we talk to the layman? So in church, we'll say something, you're preaching to the choir and I'm an engineer. There's a lot of college do, um, experts, but when we're saying we're building for, we're using words that we understand. How do we start using words that the layman understand? How do we bring these conversations to people who, in different areas where when you say a word, they're like, what the hell is that? Where sometimes I'll hear conversations and I'll get like, wow, let me go on Google and see, do I understand what ownership is? So it's been a lot of reading just, and I worked as an engineer for the last 20 years and there's so much jargon that I don't understand. So when we wanna build this um, Web3 for the world, how do we go out? And, and actually push this out to other people so that they're understanding the most simplest terms. And I guess that's just something that I'm always yeah. struggling with where it's pure jargon and I can't even grasp it. So uh, we all start grabbing ownership. I do too. 
I start grabbing, hey, let me write this token. Let me join this DAO so I could gain versus helping um, everybody else. But um, thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, That's Devin. kind of where I'm stuck. Thank you, Devin. I think many people in the chat are in agreement. Um, I know Tim Courtney, uh, a bit above, used similar words. I wonder how do we make it so the conversation around ownership connects back to the needs of everyday people. Um, so thank you for sharing. A couple other thoughts, which maybe I could pass to Andy and then Griff. Um, how do we go about collective ownership in Web3? Um, and honestly, yeah, starting with Devin and perhaps moving from there, uh, I'll let Andy and Griff, you guys decide how you wanna approach. I'll be very brief because Griff is the best and we love him. Uh, it will be delightful to hear his beautiful voice and see his beautiful face. <laughs> um, but Devin, thank you so much for saying this and for bringing it up. Um, you know, the, this is why I say like, it's so interesting to focus on language because language is the only logically decentralized system that we know. You, you, don't, you don't get to make meaning. Right? Only the community in which you are embedded makes meaning by consensually agreeing upon the use and meanings of certain words. Right? It's mind bending to truly consider that and truly humbling in the context of your own individual life. Right? You don't, it's like people go to the Buddha and they ask him, you know, you've taught us all of these beautiful things, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. How are we going to use it to make the world a better place? How are we going to use it to save the world? He says, this is an absurd question because what you're asking, like the world is this vast web of light. Every being is a single point in it, each reflecting all of the others, none obscuring any other, each its own center. And what you're asking is how do we lift the web? But the web is what it is. There's nothing other than it. So you wouldn't be able to stand anywhere to get the purchase to lift it up and you wouldn't have the strength to lift everything that is. All that you can do is raise yourself and cause ripples of light through the West, through the rest of the web. This is how meaning is made in language, right? It's directly analogous in the sense that all you can do is hear like the jargon and other people stumbling at different kinds of attempts to say what it is that they really mean and who it is that they really are. And then process it through the filter of your own embodied experience and, and speak truly and honestly and courageously your own understanding. That, 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 that's, that's all it is. And if everybody you know, does that, the world is already a fundamentally different place. This is what the perfect language actually is. It's not Ethereum. It's Rumi saying, speak a new language and the world is a new world. Speak from a different place within you, which is not about grasping for concepts, grasping for reputation, grasping to be seen in any kind of way, but just as an honest reflection of who you already are. And all of a sudden the world is completely new. Thank you. That that says a lot of light. And it, what that says to me is um, I'll communicate the best way I know how to my community. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, it's literally that simple. You know, take what's relevant, leave the rest, be like these people are just talking rubbish. Have the courage and the honesty to to, to that and and speak from who you really are to the people that you really love. Yeah. Uh, with honesty and presence and that already the world is completely different it's nothing more complicated than that thank you that was good thank you thank you thank you griff let's talk a little bit about co-op petition a little bit about commons a little bit about engineering the commons Are you here? yeah yeah you know uh this is a deep oh Hey Lauren, can you turn off the red? Yeah, sorry. We were both we're both in the same call. So uh this is this was a pretty deep conversation about the base level of like ownership and which everything is built on in web three for sure. And uh I think one of the big pieces that we missed though is that we're also fundamentally changing. Oh, I got love how you dove into economies and you know and really made that emphasis. Maybe you didn't dive into it, but like making that emphasis that you know, we, we generally live in this world where there is the economy, but actually there's many economies. There's the economy of your family, 
which is more of a gift economy. And there's, there's also Ethereum and Bitcoin, and there's the Euro and the Federal Reserve system. And, and really what, what we get to play with these mechanism designs is how are these economies structured? How is issuance maintained? And how does it build legitimacy? Mostly through stories, right? So if you take out the story from mechanism design, you're, you're killing, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And this is where token engineering really tries to come in and, and, and say it's really about all of these things. You have to have a solid story and you have to have legitimacy with and you have to have mechanisms that work. Right. And that actually what are you incentivizing There's also another thing that a uh, layer that kind of came through is this like what what is your intention? And we have this huge opportunity in the Web3 space to build economies that actually so solve uh, public goods problems, right? Which I would say is the op provide, provide value without ownership, right? Provide uh, non-excludable goods, which are public goods or common pool resources. Uh, I, I like just saying public goods for the whole, whole batch of non-excludable value, right? Uh, that, that can be, that is normally provided by governments and uh, nonprofits, but with poorly designed incentive systems, right? Nonprofits require donations and governments require taxes. That there's a cycle of violence that's like saying, hey, give me money. And people are like, I don't want to give you money. And then the government's like, yeah, we're going to provide you value. And it's like, okay, well, I guess there's, I guess I have to, you know, and it's like, why can't we turn that around? Why can't we build systems where by creating non excludable value, the people who are creating it are actually rewarded. And it's a positive loop instead of a negative loop. And I feel like this is what we really get to do with, uh, with Web3 systems is kind of flip it on its side and start spinning around so that it's like, oh yeah, you're creating value for society. And that is being valued by society, which creates this positive sum game using market dynamics generally. And uh, co what we really need to tap into though is coopetition is this system where by collaborating and competing at the same time, we build together, right? We're, everyone's building in their own little piece, but cooperating while they do it. And these systems that we have around Ethereum and Bitcoin, and they, they have like tribalism. And in many ways that creates a negative, uh, a neg some negative externalities, but also it creates this coopetition. It creates this, uh, you know, everyone in Ethereum is aligned and, and benefits when Ethereum's price goes up uh, for just to be crude about it. And, and but that, um, that brings everyone together and you can see how easy it is to collaborate in that system. And so we can take these things that we ne ne normally think of as uh, sort of negative aspects of humanity, greed, tribalism, and, and, uh, and comp competitiveness, and try to twist it through mechanism design so that those like aspects of humanity, whether they're good or bad, uh, are providing value for the system itself. And um, maybe if if you guys don't mind, I could show off the co-op the co-op the coopetition that is happening right now in the token engineering commons group, uh, which is really diving into this idea of collaborative economics. Um, is, would that be cool, Andy? I don't know how much time you even have. So maybe give me a time box. Like two, two minutes. Uh, is that enough? Or... Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so I, I guess I, I want to say uh, the, the main thing here is that we live in a world with democracy, but we have monarchy over economies. Uh, and this monarchy is shown in various ways, whether it's, uh, you know, who gets to vote on raising interest rates, right? There's a small group of people who control the nat legacy currency systems. But even in Ethereum, who voted on 32 Ether, right? Who gets to decide these aspects, right? There is a, there is a, a core technocracy who is well-suited well to make those decisions because at this initialization, they made a lot of decisions that they understand. And so it has created a sort of technocracy for better or worse, it is there. And, and that's okay, that's where we are, but I think we can do better. And this is the concept of collaborative economics. So uh, the way to do collaborative economics is to assume people are not dumb, 
Just like monarchies would have said, people can't govern themselves. They're too dumb to manage their own public goods. Well, uh, you know, we say the same thing about e economics and mechanism design. We say people are too dumb to design their own economies. We need to leave it to the experts. And that's just because people don't have the abilities to be experts. And so you have to build learning opportunities and you have to make it fun, right? Like these things are not fun. You, why would anyone wanna learn all this garbage and jargon if it's not fun? Right. And so right now there's this course in the token engineering commons uh, where we're actually designing our own economy. We have one point five million dollars that will go into this economy and anyone can design the system. Anyone can pick the opening price of the bonding curve, the vesting requirements, the actual bonding curve design, uh, the, the voting process that can change the, the parameters that are chosen at its initialization and also the conviction voting mechanism that this complex system of allocating funding. And all of these, all of these designs are accessible to anyone. And, and also that we spent a lot of time making sure that there is documentation for the jargon, right? So everyone can be aligned in the same under, uh, uh, concept. And in this way, we can actually use this idea of collaborative economics to, uh, to throw these parties where everyone gets to learn, the core people, the core community, anybody in the community gets to learn how this was designed, what decisions were made, what strategies were, uh, were decided to be executed uh, for the initialization process. And from there, then you have a base of educated uh, people who submit, who actually participated in the economic design and what's even cooler is if you don't want to design the whole thing, you just go to a party and we put on music and we, we hack around, right? We have some fun. And then uh, people present their economy and then you can actually fork it. And you, uh, oh man, I just clicked the wrong button. You can actually fork it and uh, take an economy that you like, but maybe change just one thing. And in that way, collaboratively and iteratively propose your own version of this economy. And then all, then we have this really fun voting mechanism to, to curate the top choices, the top economies that were designed and for a runoff vote. Uh, and in that way, we can collaboratively and iteratively design a public goods focused economy. And this pattern is something that the common stack is gonna put up so that other um, economies can be designed for other purposes. Like if just a few people want to, I mean, this is a long way off, but if just a few people want to build an economy that that rewards the value creation around protecting a river and keeping our river clean for, for society, they can actually create a system that rewards that continued value creation. And, and also uh, um, if they succeed, there is an upside for participating early so that you can be rewarded for success. Uh, so if you, wanna, if you wanna play, follow the TE Commons Twitter, uh, and you can actually, it's a great, if you want to uh, practice like a live token engineering opportunity, it's a really great education, uh, educational opportunity to start playing with bonding curves and other complex economies, and also just to discuss it with other people in a, in a fun environment. So uh, there's param parties every day in the TC Discord, and uh, it's going on until about the 23rd of November. Incredible, incredible, incredible. Thank you so much, Griff. There there's lots of chatter in chat to catch up on. I think we may reach out about doing a param party in the tokenomics group um, at a week upcoming. Usually it's on Monday or Tuesday. We can figure out timing, but thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, for sure. Amazing. One conversation, and please do raise hand if you have anything you want to share. We still have about 20 minutes left. Um, but one that I know we could get back to is, is one from Tim Courtney, which I'll, I'll allow you to share, um, you've you've talked about widening wealth disparity, compounding crisis, and also just worrying about the incremental benefit to those who come in the next wave. Maybe I'll let you I'll let you speak on whatever you've been feeling throughout the, the fireside. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Vivek. And um, yeah, I also kind of like I was surprised to see the the conversation that I started in Slack the other day on there, and I'm glad that that resonated. Um, but yeah, I was just, Vivek and I were just chatting, um, on a sidebar about kind of some of the feelings that this conversation is bringing up. And, you know, number one, I just want to say, it's really awesome to consider these things and, and, and really think through how the word ownership could potentially evolve, 
Um, I, I just, what, I'm, what I've been missing from the conversation is, um, you know, is how, um, how do we make it to the conversation of ownership? Um, it connects back to the needs of everyday people. And, you know, I, I posted this, um, I posted this goofy meme, linked to this goofy meme. It's, it's, you know, it's a picture of Bill Gates. It's money doesn't matter. Rich people, um, looks don't matter uh, from attractive people. And then, you know, nothing really matters, you know, Freddie Mercury, right? Um, but, uh, but it's, it's this kind of idea that we're, we're talking very philosoph philosophically about, um, you know, about ownership and, and about value. And, and even, even the thought of like, oh, well, we can only, we can only work on ourselves. Um, but there are so many people out there in the world that, you know, you can't, you can't quite do that when, when you're drowning, you can't quite do that when you're, when you're suffering. And we have this great promise, I think, of new ways of incentivizing, new ways of creating access and ownership, um, cooperation. Um, but, you know, ultimately, are we, you know, or who among us or what projects among us are going to um, help people with their everyday needs? So that's, that's just the prompt that I have out there. I don't have any answers. <laughs> I'm looking for the answers, you know, myself. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I have for the group. Yeah. One thing I would add, Tim, that I noticed from your, your point in the chat, and maybe Andy, you could touch on this a bit. One of the things that you said was about kind of like this, this next group. What about when others outside of the system are not benefiting from number go up or will benefit increment, incrementally less go up, the more number go up. And Andy, there was something that you loosely referred to there in signature economies about the design being focused on more people coming in and that being one of the main design like principles. I don't know if, if that's worth expanding upon. Maybe, um, Tim, it's a wonderful point. Uh, and you find this particular criticism of uh, like, again, like every major sort of wisdom tradition in the world over, whether it's indigenous or religious or other, as in like the sort of Greek mystery schools or some of the philosophers from around that part of the world who had this deep focus on self-knowledge, you know, the, sign above the temple at Delphi, know thyself. And you'll find the same thing across like pretty much everywhere, whether it's Advaita Vedanta and Kashmiri Shivaism, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's African indigenous religions and African indigenous ways of being and indigenous religions everywhere. Uh, if it's all about knowing yourself, then isn't this ultimately like solipsistic, selfish and self-centered? Um, and the answer is at a simplistic level, yes, it is. Uh, but the ultimate inquiry is, okay, like, what is the self, <laughs> right? Uh, okay. And many of the practices, particularly around humility and gratitude and devotion, right? These three things, especially because they point at that which exceeds the self, uh, are there primarily in order to expand my notion of self, right? Uh, so just as like a, like one kind of philosophical prompt, right? Is that like, when we talk about self-knowledge, the whole point is to, <laughs> to know the world as self, right? To, to see like heaven in a grain of sand, right? Or hold eternity in the palm of your hand, that, that kind of thing. These, these are not just words, they are also words, but they point at some experiential thing, which is, this recognition of like tat famasi or you know whatever words or no words at all that you want to use for that particular realization of what is in fact beyond the interdependence what is beyond even connectedness just is um and this in particular it helps me understand like I can only really truly love another, like once I love myself, I can only truly help another once I've helped myself. And I know how, like how confronting it is 
to, so they, it's very confronting for me to say that and how confronting it can be to hear it, right? Because it sounds deeply selfish, but they, <laughs> experientially it's not. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to get across like why that is the case um, in a way which is not dogmatic and which doesn't rely on some kind of old and abused religious or philosophical crutch. Um, but I just know so deeply that uh, while the impulse to help others is one of the most noble human attributes there is and can lead to the cultivation of the greatest virtues, uh, it has to come from a place of self-knowledge. It has to come from this place where you recognize that service is a delightful and joyful activity to be involved in because you're not serving anybody else, right? Although you stand in the line at the soup kitchen and you hand out the food, what's really joyful about it, right, is that you're recognizing that you're feeding yourself, right? That's, that, that's the, like the, 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 the yoga of service is that, that, that's the whole point of that particular path. It's the whole point of wanting to help others is to break down the notion of otherness, right? Um, in fact, that is also like at the heart of this thing of iterability and singularity. You know yourself to be completely singular, nothing else like you ever before or ever again. And yet the only reason that you know this is because it's iterable, this personality through space and time. It's itera, right? The word, it comes from Sanskrit, itara, which means other, <laughs> right? Iterability exists because others seem to, but in truth, they don't, right? Because it's all you. And that for me is kind of the place, the internal state of being from which I can truly serve, from which I can truly help. Because there I'm not about assuming what the other needs. I'm there to listen with unconditional presence. And based on that, respond. That's all. And I think that if we like arrange our world in such a way that it's always about like, how do I help the others? How do I make an impact? How do I do these kinds of things? Then inherently, just in the way that we structure our language, the way that we tell the story to ourselves internally, there is inculcated within us a sense of separation that ultimately, like again, leads to exclusion. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm aware that uh, it's all words. <laughs> I'm very deeply aware of that. Um, but there's, there's some shining and radiant core to this recognition, which exists like outside of words uh, and, and which is accessed through honesty and courage to go inwards first, despite the whole world telling you that it's like an inherently selfish thing to do. Um, because like, yeah, in that, <laughs> when you get past the ways in which we, you censor yourself through these appeals to all of the others and the needs that they have, then you can recognize, holy moly, you know, I can fulfill my own needs and in so doing fulfill those of those around me, uh, just as a natural overflow of who I am, not as some kind of stressful and anxiety inducing action that has to be enacted upon the world. Um, see, Lonnie uh, just raised hand, please. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, this was such a beautiful conversation. And I just wanted to share something in response to what Tim said. Um, wh what I'm most encouraged by, I mean, there's so many interesting UBI projects that are being birthed through the Web3 ecosystem. But what I'm really excited about is this idea of um, DAOs facilitating access to care programs like this um, on a smaller scale. So like creating these open source frameworks or templates for DAOs to use within their own communities and to facilitate uh, like a DAO basic income or you know additional stipends for food and utilities. And like if we start to think on a small scale 
um, rather than this like colonialist mindset of like a centralized authority that's going to meet everyone's needs, rather create these templates and frameworks that everyone can experiment with locally in their own communities and how that might be a pathway to solving some of these essential needs pro pro problems that we're facing as a society right now. Um, I do feel this is an extremely pressing issue and um, you know, it precludes so many people from participating even in developing these, these uh, projects and participating in Web3 if you're struggling just to survive, you know, um, some of the greatest barriers, I think, to entering this space are time and education. And that when we can start to find ways to meet people's needs, then we can start onboarding people into DAOs and, you know, both paying them and helping them sustain themselves and that can be like a really beautiful bridge into the future yeah that's stunning that's stunning again the iterability of things is kind of critical to that singular push towards greater inclusion uh and the, the one thing that i will say on 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 that point is also like in my own experience how is it that i can help others create time fascinating right because like it links to douglas rushkoff and what he's talking about and present shock in terms of this ability to conspire to breathe together and like use technologies as a way to like have more time to breathe together how does that actually happen in my lived experience not as some kind of like uh, intellectual project that i'm engaged in and it's by creating time in in my own day right it's like i find that when i'm in conversations where I'm truly coming from like a place that is relaxed, aware, responsive, unconditional, then all of a sudden the people that are in that conversation also have the permission to find that within themselves in their own ways, which need not match mine, right? But which somehow mirror it in very, very interesting kinds of Manners. And, and, and this is kind of what I'm pointing at, right? Is that like in cultivating space within yourself and cultivating time to do the things that really matter to yourself. That's what sets others free to do it in ways which are appropriate in their context and lives without you having to impose it or act in any way like patronizingly and say like, this is how you create time. Like, this is the sort of space that you should have for these kinds of activities. It's simply by just having that within yourself you know, that like you set others free to find their own light. And, and it's really important, I think, that what I'm saying is not solipsistic. Right? It's not like focus on the self to the exclusion of others. It's focus on the self until you have integrated every other into your total experience. Like it, it, it's a very different way. Uh, it's not it's not reject the world it's not reject attachment it's not reject entanglement in the daily occurrence of things because the daily occurrence of things is the miracle <laughs> it is the descent of eternity into time every moment is that mm -hmm. i saw sister's hand go see Anne as well and perhaps sister uh we have Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, I was, I, I'll be quick. I know I'm KB3, so I'm like intruding. <laughs> but I just wanted to quickly really say like this is this whole kind of thing we're circling is something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of, you know, how do we maintain and attain diverse inclusion and different perspectives? Because these will solve, those concepts will solve the issues that we're facing. And I think what I've kind of come to is like, how do we get people paid opportunities at the end of the day, right? We live in a society where we need money to survive. And in my opinion, like in Web3, we need to do a better job of getting people employed who think differently, who look different, um, who have different identities in order to jumpstart and to like a lot of people's points, this thing that we're circling because there's a reason it hasn't been jump-started is because the people aren't here to jump-start it. Um, and I think it is still challenging to get into this space. And that's what I've been finding, trying to get in full time. Um, so I wanted to drop that and I'll bow out. <laughs> strongly agree. Strongly, strongly, strongly agree. Thank you, and we love you. <laughs> Come back up more often, please. Whenever. We've been missing you. <laughs> um, I 
I will save the chat right now. And if sister, you would like to share, perhaps um, we could end there. I'm not sure if, okay. Greetings, greetings of love and light and peace and darkness. Um, yeah, give so much thanks. Today has just been so, so incredible. Um, I'd love um, any examples. I mean, I, I've taken them all from the chat, um, but any examples of truly uh, inclusive uh, DAOs, you know, anyone that you would hold up as being someone who's really cracked it. Um, um, yeah, that would be really helpful for us um, in designing. Thank you. I think that's uh, the best place to start is with N and Web3 baddies. Uh, if you ping, if you ping, ping them in Slack, uh, you, you will no doubt have an interesting conversation. That much I can certainly vouch for. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Um, if um, if I had to end on one thing, I mean, this, what, what's been on my heart about this has been the, the conversation about ownership has coincided with a conversation about Web3 moving from our nine to five jobs to a 24 seven online world. And just kind of like a deep repulsion um, is, is kind of like my initial reaction to that personally. Um, but this conversation gives space to another type of 24 seven reality, which is that the present moment that we are within is always with us and is always the most important thing to spend time within. Um, so from that perspective, it is, it is true. And um, I hope that this conversation has been a space where you can explore where ownership can go from here, the nature of signatures, the nature of economies, and how your own unique lived experience and making sure you enjoy it as much as possible is the most that you can do for others. And that's definitely what I'm taking away personally. Uh, thank you very much to Andy, as always. Thank you everyone, everyone in the chat and everyone who's been here. I'll post a link to Gather Town for those who do wanna hang out for a second after, um, but for everyone who has to go on with their days, thank you very much for sharing the recording and the chat uh, very soon. Thank you, Griff, as well. Thank you. So, so yeah, sorry for coming in late. Uh, I, I was in a work meeting earlier. Um, what was this fireside about again? It was about DAOs, right? So, <laughs> Tokens and mechanism design in theory. <laughs> uh, I wish I was, it was recorded, so I'll, I'll, I'll watch it after. Definitely, 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 definitely. Yeah. The recording will go into. I'm like, did we talk about tokens? I'm forgetting. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Good to have you here while you could be, Tian. Um, I'll pop over to the cafe, see anyone who wants to hang out for a bit. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Alfreda. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Rich, good to see you. Lauren, thank you so much for suggesting. Griff. Aaron. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I think some people are muted still. Bye. We'll be in the air meet if you are in the gather town. If anyone wants to come hang out, I don't know if you've been in there before, Griff, but it's fun. <laughs> I have. I'm joining. I'll be in there. Wonderful. All right. I'll close this out. See you there. Thanks, guys.